I'm uh, Pat Patterson, I'm the community champion at uh, StreamSets, and I'll uh, give you a little um, introduction to StreamSets uh, early on in the session. But what I'm here to talk to you about is uh, data integration with Redis, specifically via the JEDIS Java library, but also some uh, salient points, uh, whatever technology you're working with, because it all wraps the same uh, wire protocol. All right, so there's the obligatory uh, meme. My son would kill me if I didn't include this. So um, who stream sets? I'm not gonna spend much time on this. Uh, just briefly, um, our two co-founders were at uh, Informatica and Cloudera. And they could see that traditional ETL tools weren't working for the world of uh, continuous streams and big data. So they founded StreamSets in about 2015 and gathered together professionals from across the world of enterprise data. So my background was uh, Salesforce. I was there for five and a half years as a developer evangelist. We also have people from Elastic, Square, and Facebook. And a lot of our engineers are actually um, Apache committers or even uh, PMC. So uh, they've contributed to projects like Flume, Scoop, Spark, and so on. So we've really got a, a big body of uh, experience in the company. And we now have customers, dozens of customers, in fact, in fact across industries such as um, insurance, healthcare, uh, automotive, uh, financial, and so on. And we partner with a lot of the big names in uh, cloud and uh, big data. And finally, we are uh, open source, as is most of the big data uh, ecosystem. So we're Apache 2 licensed. And we've seen uh, close to, in fact, quarter of a million downloads. This slide's getting a little old, um, with about uh, half of the Fortune 100 showing up in our download logs. And we just see that accelerating over time. But I'm really here to talk to you about uh, a use case that should be uh, very uh, understandable, um, very familiar if you've done any work with uh, Salesforce APIs, and um, how we can solve that with uh, JEDIS. So Salesforce, um, it's a little San Francisco startup just up the street. Um, it's now become the source of truth for customer data in a lot of companies. And Salesforce has a whole set of APIs. Uh, anybody in the room worked with any of the Salesforce APIs? No? Okay. You'll have to take my word for it. Um, but one of the distinguishing factors is that if you're a Salesforce subscriber, API calls are a limited resource. Okay, you get so many thousand API calls per day, and you have to pay if you want more. And they're relatively slow. So I've got this little test application, and uh, it's wired in to look up customers by their account number in Salesforce, and if I hit it, it's gonna get me the information, it's just very raw. But the, the important thing at the bottom is that time taken. It's kind of, let's do, uh, it's 738 milliseconds. If I do another get, it might be a bit faster, 267 milliseconds. So it averages out at about 250 to 300 milliseconds. And uh, if you're here at RedisConf, you know that that is not particularly fast for retrieving data. So our requirement in this little use case is to be able to look up customers by that customer number. Okay, we've got uh, reps all over the com company calling customers. They need the phone number real quick uh, without having to hit Salesforce every time. We don't want to be burning through those API calls and we don't want to be taking quarter of a second each time. So my architecture, in as much as you architect a demo app, is to uh, retrieve existing data, okay? I might have uh, hundreds or thousands of accounts stored in Salesforce, so I need the data for each one to populate Redis. And I also need to keep that cache fresh somehow. And I'll go through some of the options for this. And these aren't really specific to Salesforce. These kind of options appear wherever you're uh, integrating with uh, existing data. 
So Salesforce has this set of APIs. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. But this is typical of what we see with um, a lot of uh, environments that have been around for a while. There's a REST API, which is super easy to use. It's just JSON over HTTP. Works uh, very much as you'd expect it if you've worked with REST APIs. And um, it's great for low to medium data volume. It's great for retrieving a single record, updating a single record. Uh, you have to jump through some hoops if you want to uh, update multiple records at the same time or create multiple records. The SOAP API, it's kind of XML and it's a little bit clunky, but if you've got the tooling, if you have a Java library or there's a Python library, there's a lot of tooling around these Salesforce APIs because people actually make money with this stuff. Um, it's great for that medium data volume. The sweet spot is hundreds to thousands of records that you can manipulate very, very easily just by uh, passing lists of uh, instances into the Java APIs. But it really tops out at a few tens of thousands, I think it is. You start hitting uh, the API limits. So this is when we get to the bulk API. So this is really the uh, heavy duty uh, artillery of, uh, of the Salesforce world. You can pull every bit of data out of your Salesforce environment with the bulk API, up to the millions or tens of millions of records. It's an asynchronous API, which means that we can issue a query and it's going to run that query. It could take several seconds and it'll give us a handle that we can poll and say, OK, did my query finish? Did my query finish? Did my query finish? And then we can, when it completes, we can start getting the data in batches. So it's pretty well architected for this um, bulk data case manipulating. Um, I've, I've, got a, I've got a test system where I pull half a million accounts out of Salesforce in about uh, three minutes. So. So that's like manipulating, that's getting our initial feed of data, populating our cache. What about keeping it fresh? Now, this is where we tend to have lots of choices, depending on whether we want to pull, whether we want to push, what we can expose uh, on our firewall, and so on. So the simplest one, and this will be applicable whether you're working with a relational database or just about any other data source, is just a poll for changes. Okay, so just repeat some query. Uh, usually you can use like uh, a last updated column. Uh, some, or uh, if you're uh, looking for new records, often there's a surrogate key you can use. But there's some query you can issue to get you the delta between the data you have and the data that's there now. And this works, uh, this is very simple. It works well, but there's Always a trade-off between uh, freshness and the resources you're consuming. Okay, so I could call it every 10 minutes, and that means my, my data could be up to nine minutes, 59 seconds old. Um, or I could call it every second and have really fresh data, but then I'm going, going to consume uh, thousands of API calls an hour. Um, it's possible to uh, write triggers. So in Salesforce, in common with many relational databases, you can write a trigger and you can make a call out to some endpoint and say, hey, this data changed. Uh, now, there's a couple of problems with this. The first problem is that your application has to be accessible. So if you're working with an in-house relational database, that might not be a problem. They might both be in the same network domain. If you're working with Salesforce, that means you've got to expose an endpoint on the internet and you start to get into tricky problems of how do, how do you know it's Salesforce calling? You've got to set up some shared secret or some authentication. It gets complicated very, very quickly. Um, as well as that, um, the admin, the Salesforce admin, database admin, might not want you polluting their system with your own triggers. Luckily, Salesforce has a streaming API. So if you've worked with Redis uh, PubSub, this is a familiar kind of model. It's a very different implementation. But um, it's publish, subscribe. You set up a channel, which is basically uh, a query that you're interested in. And when the results of that query change, uh, you get a message. 
So it uses a protocol called Bayer, and Bayer can wrap a number of implementations. One of them is WebSockets. Salesforce happens to use HTTP long polling. So really, under the cover, your app is actually periodically saying, hey, you got any data for me? But what happens is your app uh, underneath the library, you just make a library call and register a listener, but your app is saying, hey, got any data? And then it waits, and it keeps this HTTP connection open for, I think it's a minute or 90 seconds or so. And if there's no data, it'll just return and say, hey, there was no data. And your app immediately says, hey, got any data? But then if something does change in that period, it'll return straight away and say, hey, here's the data. So it's a simple mechanism, and it works well over, it works through firewalls, it's just HTTP, and your app is the client. So your app doesn't have to expose anything off on the internet. Um, there is an option for what they call durable streaming. So Salesforce will buffer up to 24 hours of uh, messages for you. So you can get pretty good uh, performance with this. So, I'm going to show you the code very briefly for a simple Salesforce client app. And this is not anything I'm proud of. It's basically the uh, uh, Salesforce um, sample code. So, well, the first thing you'll notice for loading a bit of data, there's an awful lot of code because this is an asynchronous API. So I have to get a connection, that's a whole function. Um, I've got to create a job, so I've got to tell Salesforce what query I want it to run. Um, I've got to get this batch info thing, and then I've got to poll until it's complete. So I've got to keep on saying, hey, is my data ready? And then once it's done, I can process the results. And here it's pretty simple. I just iterate through this query results thing, and I get uh, some nice data that right now I'm just going to print out. And then I can subscribe for notifications. And again, it's a whole bunch of boilerplate code here with this buyer thing to ultimately, if I scroll down and down and down through all of the um, all of the uh, print statements here. Basically, I receive a message, and um, I'm going to dump it out um, to the terminal. I'm just going to say, OK, go through the fields that I've got. Um, one, thing I, one thing I should add, a common pattern here is to say to Salesforce, OK, when something changes, just give me the ID of the record, and then I'll do a query and get all of the fields because you get into situations where there could be multiple fields changing. Often you just want to say, okay, I know that that record change, just give me everything. And that's what I'm doing here. So I get this ID and I retrieve the data for that, for that particular ID and then I dump it out. So anyway, so uh, we can run this and uh, it should just uh, compile and run and it should just say, I've got a bunch of data. I put, uh, this is a standard Salesforce uh, developer environment, so it's got about 13 accounts, so I'm not wasting time watching it scroll through. But now it's waiting for this stream data, and if I go and I change something in Salesforce, say, stream set suddenly wants to work in shipping rather than technology. If I save that, I go back and I see, I see that I received a message that's there and then I uh, got one object, and it's this account, and if I go down, it should say uh, industry is shipping. So that's great, so I've got, uh, I've got data working from, uh, from Salesforce. Now comes the redicization of this. So, uh, Jedis, who in the room has used Jedis already? Oh, great. Okay, about half. I'm not going to be going super deep here um, because I learned Jedis in order to do this session. And I have to say, it was a very pleasant experience. It works very well. So, Redis has been around since, what, 2009 or so? And Jedis came along uh, less than two years later, in late 2010. Um, its author, Jonathan Libuski, um, describes it as small, sane, and easy to use. And that's my experience. I found that it's a, kind of a minimal wrapper over the uh, Redis command set that gives you enough help to, to be useful, but doesn't start building abstractions that uh, are its own thing rather than just exposing Redis. 
It's compatible with the versions of Redis that you're likely to be using. And what, one of the things I really like is it's licensed under MIT. So essentially, uh, take this and use it, and don't sue us if it goes wrong. Um, it seems to have the largest community of the various uh, Java um, libraries for Redis. And as you'd expect, it's all, it's all on GitHub and has been for a long time. So the way that Jedis works, is anybody here not a Java programmer? OK, one, two, three, four, OK. So there's some boilerplate here, import the Jedis library. And then I basically say, uh, New Jedis. So this will work uh, if you're on running on the same box as your Redis server, and you know you can add uh, things like the host name and uh, add parameters like the host name and uh, authentication details and everything if if you need to. But this is really nice and simple. So I can just set a key, set foo with bar, and then I can just get the value of that key. Okay, it maps directly onto the Redis commands that you know from uh, the CLI and the documentation. Um, hashes are going to be the natural uh, data structure for representing the Salesforce data, okay? What I've got in my mind is I've got an account number as the key, and I've got the various uh, fields and their values from Salesforce as the contents of the hash. So uh, I can do things like uh, H set with some key. So Pat set my employer to stream sets, set my position to community champion, and then uh, H get works completely as you would expect. Uh, I give it a, a key and a field, and it gives me back that item of data. Now there's a little bit of Javaization in that if I do get all on a key, I get uh, a mapping of strings to strings. But it's exactly as you would expect. You know, you couldn't imagine many other ways of getting a hash back in a, a single API call. So here's my first cut of um, uh, redicizing my app. So I'm going to use the magic of Git now. So I literally just say new Jedis localhost. Um, I give some diagnostic call, you know, go into the Jedis uh, instance there just to make sure that uh, just as a sanity check. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to flush the cache to begin with. I just want to start from a known state. So then. Uh, inside that uh, method where I'm processing the API results, um, I'm just going to call H set key field and value. So this is just, I, I figure out where that account number is. So figure out which column it is in the data because it's just coming back as CSV data. And then I get that uh, string and then I just set those um, values in the, uh, in the database, in, the, in Redis. And then, <clears throat> excuse me. And then, uh, similarly, in my uh, subscription, when I receive one of these messages, I do the same thing. I set the hash. Now, um, there is an HM set method, I think. So you could set. I'm, I hear I'm setting the hash field by field. I could build my own map and set the whole hash in one call. But it's kind of a bit of a trade-off. I've got to uh, create and populate that map versus, uh, and so I've got to do that in a loop, versus, it, versus just calling um, Redis in the loop. And um, to be honest, calling Redis doesn't create objects that have got to be garbage collected, so that's the way I went. But there are choices pretty much uh, uh, about how you can do it. So. Let's see how this works. So if I rerun, so it'll rebuild. And so I'm flushing it at the beginning, so uh, I should have as many accounts as uh, I pull out in here, and it pushes them in, and now it's waiting. So if we go and have a little look in, uh, in Redis, let's, whoops. So we've got 14 keys. So things are as we would expect. And we can do uh, get one of those keys. So that's direct from Redis. That's one of our accounts, AB123456. And if we do it from my little app, I should be able to see that if I switch to 
geez, really? I know, I'm here. <laughs> if I switch to Redis, then I do a get, then the time is one millisecond. So, you know, you get, the, you get that Redis performance you know and love. Uh, yeah, every time I do it, it's like one, sometimes it's three, sometimes it's zero. But yeah, an average of one millisecond response. And importantly, it's just going to Redis. It's not, it's, I hit Salesforce that one time with that query, and then um, I leave it alone. But what happens when uh, we change? Say, customer priority, uh, StreamSets is a medium priority customer. Let's make them high priority. Save. So if I go back to here, we can see like straight away that that, uh, that message was received, and I pushed it into Redis, and if we go back to here, then if we uh, do a get again, then yeah, within a second or two, uh, the data's consistent, and my Redis cache is in line with uh, Salesforce. So um, this is really nice, this, uh, this behavior, but, um, there's one issue in the implementation as it stands, and you don't notice it at all with 14 records, but if you were doing 14,000, you probably would. And that is every time we call hset, it's a round trip to the server. Okay, so we send the hset request, we get the response, and then we send another one, we get a response, and we're doing this several times per record, so we could be doing this thousands of times, and that latency, that request response latency adds up. So pipelining allows us to issue uh, multiple commands against the server without waiting for the acknowledgement each time. So you can imagine it is like a pipeline. I just send, keep sending, sending, sending instructions to the Redis server, and then sooner or later I'm going to say p.sync, and um, it's going to uh, tell, wait till all those operations are applied, and then tell me what happened. So uh, if I update my app, where are we now? So in the code, it's really, really uh, simple. So I can just search for pipeline. So I get the, this is the typical pattern. I get the pipeline before the loop. Um, and the really, really nice thing here is that this pipeline object mirrors the basic Redis client. So I can just call all those same uh, operations, those same methods, it's got the same interface. So on the pipeline thing, P, I can say hset uh, key, field, and value. So my code with just adding pipelined and uh, the sync at the end, my code just works the same way. And there's a little bit of thought you've got to put into this. You probably don't want to send a million records to Redis and then say sync. You probably want to split them up into uh, smaller batches, so maybe a thousand at a time, because then you, you can have, uh, have some confidence that things are going well before you, before you sync and you've got like, all of that data to, uh, to be applied. All right, so the pipelining. Now, if you try and do this in a real application, and you have multiple threads going on, you'll notice very, very quickly that the um, JEDIS client is not thread safe. Okay, it's uh, holding a connection to Redis and it's sending commands and if two threads happen to get the same client, those commands can start getting interleaved and um, bad things happen very, very quickly. So for this reason, one of the facilities that JEDIS gives us is the connection pool. So we can say to uh, JEDIS, okay, keep some number of connections handy. When I want one, I'm gonna ask for it. And when I'm done, I'm gonna give it back to you. And so in this way, I can have multiple threads uh, requesting connections from the pool, so pool.getResource, and they don't bump into each other. If there can be multiple clients active, multiple connections active, active to Redis at the same time, and they get reused, because when I'm done, I return it to the pool, and it can be used by another thread down the line. And the, one, one bit of uh, uh, Java here is that we say, uh, try to get the resource in this uh, try block, and it's, it supports the auto-close behavior, so it's gonna get automatically re 
are released uh, when that, cur uh, that second curly breaks. So kind of when we're done with it in that block, it's going to automatically go back into the pool. And then at the end of your app, you can call pool destroy and clean the whole thing up. I didn't do pooling because my demo is like single app, but it's a really uh, useful thing to know about. The other really interesting thing is, so pipelining is just a performance optimization. Okay, we're sending all these operations to Redis, setting all these values, and they're all going to get applied in order, um, and it's going to tell us how it works at the end. But there's nothing to stop other apps from making changes in the middle of all that. And that might lead to some unexpected behavior. We might not be expecting uh, changes in between the uh, uh, operations that we perform. So um, we have transactions. And again, here, Jedis is just wrapping the Redis functionality and giving us uh, a wrapper for multi that gives us a transaction object. And again, it's just like, this is the thing I really liked when I was using Jedis. It's just like this code except uh, now we've got a transaction object and we call the same methods and set the same uh, values and it all just works nicely. And then at the point when we say execute the transaction, all of those operations take place uh, atomically. So they take place in Redis and nothing else can be interleaved in, in between them. It's as if you like shut out the rest of the world and said, okay, do my stuff and then you can carry on. So really nice uh, behavior there. You could, things like if you're halfway through the transaction, you can say, oh, I hit some kind of error. I can discard everything that went before. You get the, a lot of the familiar transaction behavior from, say, a relational database world. We actually, we actually built um, a connector to Redis using the, the Jedis library in StreamSets. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop this guy because I don't want it colliding. And I'm going to flush the database very quickly. And then uh, I can go to stream sets. So if you don't want to write code, um, this, is, this is my company's product, so it's not like a big ad, but um, we actually use Jedis in our implementation here. And so we can build a pipeline and here's my Salesforce connector with my query. So this uh, project is in a bit of a psychotic mode. But I, that's my query, select all my accounts. Um, I send it through a lookup, basically, if, the, if it came via uh, the subscription. Otherwise, I send it directly. I remove any null fields because Redis doesn't like those. And then I can send it straight to Redis. And also, I can send it to um, a file as well so I can do some debugging. So I flushed my cache, so I shouldn't have anything there at all now. Yep, I've got nothing there. So if I say play on here now, then I should get exactly the same behavior. I get a little bit of visibility in here. So uh, I should see some process records work. Yep. So um, it's processed the records in Salesforce. Oh, I know what I've done. It keeps track of where it was last time. So I've got to reset it. It was just getting those four changes since the last time I'd run it. So this time it should get all 14 that are in the in Salesforce, push them through. And it's saying there's 28 records written out because I wrote into Redis and to a file. But now I should be in the same situation that I can look up. All my data's there and I can change it. I can say, okay, let's go from shipping back to technology. And I can look over here and it'll go from 14 to 15. Bing, bing. All right. Oh, I know what I did. Oh, no, there it is. And then, uh, yeah, I can go over here and say get, and I'm back to technology. So, um, and I'm kind of like got one minute left, so I could like dive into the code, but suffice to say, um, we're actually just using the exact same uh, H set. There we go. Um, Pipeline S add, so there we're just using the exact same um, uh, L push. Where is it? There's an H set around here somewhere for setting hashes. We're using the exact same um, pipeline uh, APIs as I described a few minutes ago.
So, um, yeah, wrapping up. Uh, Jedis, if you haven't used it already, uh, provides, yeah, I would actually agree um, with the statement that it's a small, sane, easy to use wrapper around the Redis wire protocol. I found it very, very easy to use. Um, and I really like the way that you, you have the same interface no matter whether you're working raw or in a pipeline or in transaction. Um, Use pipelining for bulk data transfer. If you're doing anything more than a handful of operations, it really uh, will uh, optimize the throughput. And uh, use pooling for thread safety. So that's definitely something uh, we use in stream sets. You can have multiple of these Redis uh, connectors active at the same time. So we just uh, get connections out of the pool. And if you're writing data into Redis and you don't want to have to write a bunch of code, then uh, check out StreamSets. It's open source and free for download. And uh, we, as well as the Redis destination, we have a Redis pub sub origin and a Redis lookup as well. So you can look up values as they go through the pipeline. OK, and I'm out of time. So if you want to ask any questions, you can catch me as I disassemble. But uh, thank, you for, uh, thank you for your attention.